adopt her if she didn't have a mama. Amen. <laughs> How many of y'all happy? Y'all remember what I preached last Wednesday night on where's your happy place? Well, I'm going to preach to you tonight on how to get in your happy place. If you're saved, born again, your happy place is in Jesus. So why are we not happy? Why are so many struggling today? Why are so many homes struggling, marriages struggling, preachers struggling? I, uh, I've been doing this for 46 years. And uh, I always had a happy church. Because I always thought that a happy church starts in a pulpit with a happy preacher. And we got everything in the world to thank God for. But there's a condition that must be met. You see, here, here's the thing about God. God wants to bless us. I said that last Wednesday. But the problem is the conditions for God to bless us is up to you, not God. God's already said, I want to bless you. But those blessings are conditional. Salvation is conditional. God has offered it to every man. But you have to believe God and trust God for God to bless you and save you. So salvation is conditional. God's blessings is conditional. A happy marriage is conditional. In counseling, all that I've married, some 96 in my ministry, 
I've always told them a 50 50 marriage won't never work. Can't work. 100% for each other will work. So the same thing applies with God 100% for God, and God's 100% for you. That's the way God works. And so I, I want to preach a little bit tonight. I got loud last Wednesday. And I got loud Sunday morning in my Sunday school class. And I can't hardly get loud tonight. I'm, this is about all I've got left. So I don't know what would happen if I'd get a whole week's meeting. Probably by Thursday night I'd be whispering. But anyway, open your Bibles to Matthew. Chapter 18. I told somebody 13, so... That tells you how, much, how long I've had. Shannon was right. I called him today and I said, uh, you, has Jason called you? He said, no. I said, well, you need to do the blessings and lead the music tonight. He said, well, good. <laughs> That's my preacher. I love him. Everybody there, chapter 18 of Matthew. I find one phrase in there that I have looked at and thought about it, and there's a same phrase is found in Luke chapter 22. At, this, at that same time came the disciples. Now, who's writing? Matthew. Who's talking? Jesus. Who's he talking to? His disciples. I hope that clarifies what I'm fixing to say. Who's writing? Matthew. Who's talking? Jesus. Who's he talking to? His disciples. At that time, at that same time, came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest? I hope that wasn't a gun. If it did, I'm dead. It sounded like a gun, didn't it? I, I, I started to reach up there and see if it hit me. Oh, Lord, that's scary, man. And you don't never know what's going to happen in church. I mean, you know, they can kill you. Uh, two ways, they can shoot you or talk about you. That's the same thing. I mean, you're dead either way. <laughs> well, add a little laughter to this place. Some of y'all look bad this day. I guess you're tired. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now that's the question that the disciples asked Jesus. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. He called that little child unto him and he set that little child, a boy or girl, in the middle of those disciples. And he said, when you see that verily in the Bible, that's like a railroad crossing. Stop, look, and listen because God's fixing to say something. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted. Now, who's writing? Matthew. Who's talking? Who's he talking to? What's he talking about? There's the problem. Except you be converted. And become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso, and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. Now, turn over to Matthew, or Luke chapter 22. Same thing. Dr. Luke is writing. Who's talking? 
Who's he talking to and what's he talking about? Over here in Matthew 18, he ain't talking about salvation because those disciples already believed and were, had received him as a promised Messiah. Am I correct or not? John chapter 1 will tell you that. Now, we get to Matthew or Luke 22, and in verse 31, and the Lord said, so Jesus is talking again, Simon, flesh, Simon, flesh, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. Amen, sister, whoever said that. Amen. I'm glad Jesus prays for us, ain't you? If he didn't pray for me, I'd been in trouble a long time ago. But I have prayed for you that thy faith fail not. So Peter has faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the promised Messiah. Any, any argument there? And when thou art converted, same word, strengthen the brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell thee, Peter, the new man, Simon the old man, Peter the new man, Simon the old nature, Peter the new nature. I tell thee, Peter, that the cock shall not crow this day before thou hast thrice denied that thou knowest me. Now, I want to speak to you for a few minutes how to get in your happy place or how to find your happy place. I'd love to read autobiographies about preachers. One of them I read was a man named Gypsy Smith. And uh, he was a, an evangelist. He was called to preach at the age of 17. He was simple. He was original. And he was colorful. He said, I was born in a field. Don't put me in a flower pot. He was not a theologian. But he loved God's word. He loved flowers. But not botany. Salvation, but not theology. And was advised when he used to try to sing, was told to sing from his diaphragm. Gypsy replied, he didn't want to sing from his diaphragm, he wanted to sing from his heart. That's what I told my choir. I used to sing and add words with a choir and I'd be just singing and I'd just keep right on they're supposed to go somewhere else and I was adding words so somebody, somebody told me one time just, just sing the words it's there. I said no it sounds better the way I'm singing it and that's exactly what Gypsy Smith was saying when they told him sing I didn't even know you had one of them till I had throat surgery and then Dr. Bogart said speak from your diaphragm I said what is that she said way down here and not up here. So he was quite a, a man. And they was asking one time, said, uh, Gypsy, what is the secret to your freshness and vigor and joy? And he said, I have never lost the wonder of God in me and living for him. Now I want to tell you what triggered this message that I preached in 1982. We moved to Tennessee and there was just a little bitty thing and I'd planted a garden. 
And uh, she had seen me praying over that garden. And I'd pray, Lord, I want potatoes, green beans, cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, and all that stuff. Well, Deborah was out there in the garden one day, and she hollered, Daddy, Daddy, he said, Tubercumber, Tubercumber. <laughs> what she found was a little cucumber about that big. And that thrilled that young lady to death. She got all excited over a tubercumber. <laughs> How many of y'all ever got excited over a tubercumber? Uh, Amanda's here tonight. <laughs> She sent on Facebook and had a picture there, my happy place. And you know where she was at? In her garden. And I told her, I better get a mater. That's a tomato, by the way. I said, I better get a mater from your happy place. She said, I promise you. So if she don't, when Jason gives an invitation, she's come up here and repent and get right with God and go get me a mater, all right? Say amen, Amanda. All right. Now, Brad tried to tell me I planted that garden. I said, don't make no difference. It's hers because it's her happy place. So I want to talk to you about how do you get to your happy place? Gypsy Smith, when they asked him, said, I've never lost the wonder of God and living from him. You see, Gypsy Smith had the heart of a child because he never lost the wonder of God. And I really believe in my heart that that's what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 18, 3, except you be converted and become as a little child or little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to explain myself why I said that. Have you ever thought about a child I, I, I watch you mamas fret and worry because your little one's just playing on that thing out there in front of the church. Can you imagine a wall, a brick, making a, those children as happy as they are, and yet y'all worry to death about it? Why are you worried? They're in their happy place. Let them play. Some of y'all do good to get in there with them. Maybe you'd find your happy place. Instead of fretting because your child is in that little hole in the ground out there surrounded by brick with a flag in the center. That's a happy place for North Point Baptist Church. And yet y'all fuss at them because they're in there. They're going to get dirty. That's a child. Some of y'all need to get dirty. Get in the sandbox with them. You'd be surprised what that would do for your child if you got in a sandbox and played with their trucks with them and become a part of their life, of their happy place. And that's exactly what God wants you to do. God wants you to get in your box and enjoy what you have in Him and fellowship with Him and, and tell Him that I love you and thank God for the tuber chumber that I just found. We're talking about getting in your happy place, enjoying your Christian life and your fellowship with God. I'm just getting started, okay? Now, when he was asked that question, what's the secret to your freshness, your vigor, and your joy? And he said, I've never lost the wonder of God living in me and living for Him. And I want to speak for a few minutes on have you lost your wonder or have you lost your happy place? Now I'm going to tell you how to find it and how to get back to it. Children, I had two. They still have a sense of surprise. I wish you could have saw the face, my daughter's face, when she found that cucumber. They still have a sense of surprise, a child does. Anything may happen. 
Everything is new. Every turn of the road holds a glad discovery for a child. You see, you mamas and daddies have had children, but you don't really watch them. You don't, you don't understand what entertains a child. They, they, I've, I've seen my son play with a box that the truck I bought come in. So what I should have done, just got the box and left the truck at the Kmart. That's what I should have done. I mean, I wanted to be a blessing to him and got him a truck, but here he has the truck sitting over here and he's playing with the box. Y'all might get this sometime, and I hope you do, because I found a discovery of how to be happy in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, every day, every day is a happy day for them. I'm, I mean... The most commonest humdrum day is glorified by the glamour of imagination, of just living. And all too soon, and sooner now than ever, our children lose the sense of wonder. I asked some little girls out there in the vestibule, I said, y'all excited about going back to school? What do you think they said? No. I mean, I, I, I was excited about going back to school. Now, I wasn't excited about staying in class, but I was excited about going back to school because that's where all my friends was at. That's why I'm excited about coming to church. Amen. Come on now. That's why I'm excited about coming to church. You know why? Because this is where the only friends I've got is in churches that I've pastored and in Haynes Baptist Church. Some of y'all need to get your hands out of your pocket and shake hands with somebody and say, I'm Larry Walker, who are you? And they'll tell you their name, some may be reluctantly, but they'll tell you. And so, well, I just want to tell you that I appreciate you. I tell Taylor that every time she comes to the rescue mission, except one time, and I ain't got over that yet, but anyway, she comes to the rescue mission and sings. Every time I, I ask her, every time we go down there, are you coming to the rescue mission to sing? You know why? Because she's a friend of mine. And, she, and I love to hear her sing. Because God's using her to do that. God can use you. You say, well, I don't have no talent. God give you one, you got enough sense to get out of the rain. <laughs> but all too soon our children lose the wonder. And, the, and they're not entirely to blame either. Because adults have lost the wonder. And when you lose the wonder with your children, your children will lose the wonder. I'm, I'm working towards something now. Here, here's, the, here's how you lose that wonder and your happy place. We, we must always be doing something. We don't have any time to walk in the woods. We don't have any time to sit before an open fire. Just thinking and just talking. Everything is organized, supervised, planned, and programmed. We don't walk. We take organized hikes. We don't wander along watching birds. We join clubs and keep records. We don't Gary, I, I don't, I'm not trying to offend you right here now or anybody that has a camper, okay? But we don't camp anymore because we need TV, radio, gas stoves. Michelle, I'm telling a true thing. And we got to pull it with a big truck. If it's hot, we got to have an air conditioner on. If it's cold, we got to have a furnace on. 
And that's the way we camp. Well, that's not camping. Camping's living in a tent with skeeters and varmints and bugs. That's what camping, I camped for four years in a Marine Corps. I'm, I'm working to something now. Y'all just stay with me. We lose a wonder in the work of it. Here's what church reminds me today. If Ephesus was probably had one of the greatest churches in the New Testament. And Jesus writing unto that church said this. And the angel of church of Ephesus right. John's writing. What's he writing about? A church. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou cannot bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, you'll find that word over in, I forget the chapter, but that's what Peter said, Lord. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. And then Jesus says this, Remember, therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first work, or else I will come to thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now I used to tell my churches, three that I pastored, that when that church was founded, when Haynes Baptist Church was founded, when those three that I pastored was founded before I got there, God put a candlestick and wrote on it Haynes Baptist Church, Chestoa Baptist Church, North Point Baptist Church, and Faith Baptist Church. God put a candle and he walks amongst those candlesticks. And I'm going to tell you all something. When you leave your first love, God will put that candlestick out. And then you become confused and frustrated because there's no friendship, there's no fellowship, there's no joy, there's no happiness in your work for God. And I wrote some things down years ago. Now this brings, that's my introduction. Now we're going to talk about our Christian experience. What should be a life of faith, working by love, listen to me, becomes high pressure, religious activity, program planned and organized. A childlike Christian does not lose the wonder. And there ought to be in every child of God a sense of surprise, a glad expectancy because this is my father's world and anything can happen as long as me and God are happy together. Amen, Terry. Bless God, somebody's listening. We, we should live on the miracle level. <laughs> what are you talking about, preacher? Preacher. Several years ago when I was at Faith, I was diagnosed with a five-centimeter aneurysm just above the aorta vein that splits and runs down both legs. My doctor told me, he said, this will be a 16-hour surgery. And he said, I'm going to cut you from here all the way to your girl. I'm going to take your whole insides out. And he said, when I take pressure off of that aneurysm, if it ruptures, you'll bleed out before I can do anything. 
I was scheduled for surgery on Tuesday. Sunday night, one of my deacons called me out and said, Preacher, God has put on my heart to anoint your head with oil. Do you have the faith to believe that God can heal you and do a miracle in you? I said, if it's his will, yeah. So he called all the deacons on this side and our wives on the other side. And we prayed. And Harold took that bottle of olive oil. Now, folks, I'm not lying to you. I'm fixing to tell you what happened. When he dipped his finger in that olive oil and put it on my head, all of a sudden, it's just like warm oil went from my head and come out the bottom of my feet. Monday, I went to pre-op. And the doctor said, we're going to do a CT scan before we operate. I did a CT scan and something unusual happened. They sent me back to do a thing you ladies do, a sonogram, is that what it's called? See if you've got a baby or not. Is that what that's called? Okay, that's what they were going to do. Because... He told me, said, uh, most of me over, I said, here's what a five centimeter aneurysm looks like. And I said, well, I guess we're going to have surgery. He said, but that ain't yours. He said, here's yours and ain't nothing there. But he he didn't believe that. He he sent me back there and I laid on my tummy back and them ladies put some sticky stuff on me and run that thing over and that nurse just shook her head called another lady over and she did the same thing. She shook her head and she looked at me and she said, Preacher, we don't say nothing. Well, there's a black lady standing to my right and she jumped about a foot in the air and said, God has healed that preacher. I say live on the miracle level. Nothing is impossible with God. I don't care what you're going through. And I've been through it here in the last seven months of my life. And I'm not saying I had faith like I should all the time. But you're looking at a miracle that I can even walk today because Dr. Brandt said I probably never would walk. And so, anything can happen. If God be for us, who can be against us? If you, if you look in, in Luke 22, God told Peter, said, Peter, the devil wants you and he's going to sift you. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have. That's what he wants. He wants your joy. He wants your happiness. He wants your peace. Anything that he can make you miserable, that's what he wants. And if you start talking to him, he'll take it every time. And he won't give you nothing back. God don't take anything but gives you everything. (laughs) Amen. Count your blessings. Count them one by one. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted. Now, Conversion starts on the inside, right up here. When thou art converted, I don't mean salvation. Peter's already a disciple. These others were disciples. That's not salvation. So what in the world is he talking about? Converted. I, I, you know, I said for a few minutes, I want to back up about two steps here. When we come to church on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, Sunday night. We ought never to start for a meeting without saying, this may be the greatest of all Sundays. This may be the greatest Wednesday night that I've ever experienced. This may be the greatest revival that we've ever had. We have them three days now. When I was pastoring, we had them two weeks. 
because it took a week to get the church right and then after they got right, then sinners would get saved. We get used to being a Christian. I'm going to rephrase that. We get used to being saved. We lose the wonder of it. We take it for granted. And when you do, you lose the wonder of it. There is nothing under the sun, and I wrote this down, there's nothing under the sun that can be more dry, more flat, more tedious, more exhausting, more burdensome, as Christian activity without the wonder of it. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? When you get up here to sing, smile a little bit. When you come through the doors of the church, smile a little bit. You all don't feel like it. Well, tell God about it and you'll feel like it. Some of y'all come in and and I work just like y'all. I pastored a church, everyone I hadn't worked. I was tired on Wednesday, but I, before I come into church, I, on the way there, I'd say, Mama, this is going to be the greatest Wednesday night we've had at Faith Baptist Church. And you'd be surprised. Some Wednesday night, I didn't even get to preach. Like some of y'all, Sunday night, probably felt like testifying, but you didn't do it. I had a lady at Faith one night. I knew I could see it all over her. I was sitting up there in the chair. Man, she, I mean, God was all over her, and she grabbed her mouth to keep from shouting. And I called her out on it. I, I told her, I called her name. I said, you're supposed to shout it tonight and didn't do it, wasn't you? She said, I did. I was. I said, well, the next time, let her rip. Don't worry about me. I can handle it. Oh, hallelujah. Nothing. I mean, some of us dread going to church because you got to get up and get ready. You got to fix your hair, put your makeup on. We get bored by the sermon. I, I told my wife the other, other Sunday morning, I said, Look out across this congregation. What do you see? Franny faces. When's he going to get done? Lord, we've done been here an hour and a half. When's he going to get done? We get bored with a sermon. That lady knows what I'm talking about sitting right there on that second row, amen. I mean, we get bored by the sermon. Sunday school puts us to sleep. Church visiting is drudgery. Singing in the choir becomes a chore. The wonder of it and the joy and the happiness has become duty. Then I thought about this, the wonder of God. You ever thought, you ever thought about God? In the beginning, God. Stop right there. In the beginning, God. What? In the beginning, God. Who is God? Is he a stranger to you? Do you talk to him every morning and every night? Do you say to the Lord good night before you go to sleep at night? Do you get up and read his love letter he wrote to you? Who is God? Well, Colossians said that he created everything. And, and, and I know what time it is, and I'm losing ground every second. In, in Colossians... I just said in my study this afternoon, and, and, I, and I read this. I read it all the time because it's such a blessing to me. I'll get there in a minute. It's right after Philippians. I know exactly where it's at. Listen to this. I don't even know where to start reading. I love to read all 29 verses, but I don't have time. Verse 10 of Colossians chapter 1. That ye might, might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increase, in, increasing in the knowledge of God. That means I keep learning and learning and learning. Strengthen with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering and, oh, joyfulness. 
giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, whoo, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Look at that next verse. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you who were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked work, yet now hath he reconciled. You say, well, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, let me read what you was one day. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Where in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of your city is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now God said that. The one that spoke everything into existence is my heavenly Father. So I should... First of all, find my happy place in God. Not in Jason, not in me, not in your wife or your husband, but in him. Number two, the wonder of your salvation. Have you ever thought about that? You were dead in trespasses and sin. And God loved you. You had cursed him like I did. You had committed a lot of things that wasn't right, but yet he still loved you and still does. That by grace through faith we're saved. And look at, and whosoever will may come, which included me on that Sunday morning on August the 19th, 1963. He included me. Whosoever will, I don't care what your pedigree is, where you come from, how rich you are, how poor you are, how bad you've been, how good you've been. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. Whosoever will may come. The wonder of Jesus. The Alpha and Omega became man and laid down his crown and took on the form of a man and was born in a virgin's womb, lived there nine months and was born in Bethlehem. In a stable, the King of Israel, the Messiah, God Almighty, was born in a stable with a bunch of cows and donkeys and horses. Where was you born? I was born at home. A midwife delivered me. Most of y'all youngins here were born in a hospital, laid in a little bassinet with a whole bunch of other babies. Not my, not my Savior. He was born, made himself lower than man to die for me. That's who Jesus was. And he came a knocking on August the 19th, 1963. He knocked. He had knocked two days on a Sunday morning and a Wednesday night before that third time I went in Pleasant View Baptist Church. He didn't have to come back. 
But he walked up and I felt him knock on my heart. You know what he said? I love you. I love you. But I, my toenails curl up when my wife says, honey, I love you. How about yours? Now, I don't know what it does for her when I say I love you, honey. But I do see a light at, in, in, I look in her eyes when I tell her that. And we've been married 55 years. Jesus loved me before the foundation of the world. That's who Jesus, he is the son of God. And you will stand before him one day in one of two ways, either love or judgment. You may not have one crown to throw at his feet, but if you're saved by the blood of the Lord, you're going to heaven. You may not have nothing to lay at his feet, but God still loves you and you are in the family of God. But I, I, I said, God, I just want one. I want, a, I want a crown of faithfulness. There are five you can have, but that one faithfulness is the only one I'm interested in. I want to hear him tell me, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Come on in. That's Jesus. Now listen to this. The wonder of God's word. Does reading the pages of this book thrill your heart? Is what I just read in Colossians, what I just read in Ephesians chapter 2, what I read in John 3, 16, what I read in Matthew 18, does that thrill your heart? Well, I don't never read it. Then I, the one or two things is wrong. You've lost the wonder or you ain't never had it. The wonder of God's Word. I'm going to tell you how you got saved. You got saved by this book. You didn't get saved by song. You didn't get saved because you cried. You didn't get saved because there's some kind of emotional experience you had. You got saved because that man or woman that led you to the Lord took the Bible and took you on the Romans road for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, there's now no condemnation then which are in Christ Jesus. If you confess your mouth to the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what this Bible says. And then there's another one in John 5, 24, which I always take that verse of Scripture and read it to that Christian who has come to recommit their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. John 5, 24. I would like all of y'all to turn over there. This is the verse of Scripture that I've used. If you come up here and say, I'm saved, but I want to confess my sin to the Lord, then this is the verse of Scripture I'm going to read to you. Because you, go, you feel like you're lost. You ever felt like that? I, I've been to the altar and I said, God, there ain't no way I'm saved. <laughs> and I'm a preacher. I, I'm honest to God, I have went to the altar and said, there ain't no way I'm saved because of what I've been thinking. What's been running through my mind the suggestion that this flesh suggests to me. I know y'all ain't never done that, but listen to this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, who's you, you? He that heareth my word and believeth on me that sent me, believeth on him that sent me, and what's that next three words? Hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. I can't come into condemnation. Now God might convict me of sin and wrong, but he ain't going to condemn me. Can't condemn me. Because if he does, he's got to condemn his son. <laughs> Amen, Shannon. The blood bark, that's all God's looking at. Amen. And it's all, I don't know where he put it. I know it ain't on this red muscle that's pumping blood through my veins, but I have a blood mark on me. The wonder of being born again. <laughs> I don't ask a person, are you a Christian anymore? I say, have you, have you been born again by the blood of Jesus? Made free of sin? Not condemned anymore? 
a new creation in, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And as a Christian, as a born-again sinner, listen to me. I have a right to the throne of God. And I am an heir and joint heir with Jesus Christ. And then lastly, and I'm done, the wonder of his church. The Bible says in Malachi that I am a peculiar treasure. I am the apple of his eye. His most beloved possession. Translated out of this world. Final destination, heaven. (laughs) In the world, but not of the world. I am a stranger and a pilgrim looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. (laughs) This ain't my home, folks. I'm telling y'all, now that's how you get in your happy place. This is not my home. I, I could read it to you about what it's like. It's got streets of gold. It's got 12 gates of pearl. It's got 12 foundations. Ain't no sin going to enter. Ain't no night up there. Because he is the light. Destination heaven. Mark me. I already got my ticket. Fact of my life, I got it punched. I'm 79 years old. September the 28th, this year I'll be 80. I never thought I'd make eight, let alone 80. My fifth grade teacher told my mom and daddy I'd be in jail before I was 16 years old. I don't know where she is saved or not, but I hope she was. And God just pulled back the curtain and said, down there is that boy you said was being jailed for you 16 years old. That's how you get in your happy place. So what are you going to do about it? Stay the way you are? Leave the same way you come? I'm not. If I ain't right when I come through them doors, I'm going to be right before I leave. Matter of fact, I'm going to get right before I even come over here. I had a little talk with Jesus in my study this afternoon. I said, God, I ain't much. But you said I'm worth all the world got to offer. You told me in your word that I'm a prized possession because you sealed me until the day of redemption. You wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life and ain't nobody can remove it. (laughs) Man, some of y'all, I think there's something wrong. I want to stand up, but I can't. (laughs) Just be happy and know it. These little songs, these little kids sing. I mean, think about some of the words that they sing. And they see you come in the house with a frown on your face and you're yelling and kicking the cat and the dog. And they wonder, what's wrong with you, mama or daddy? And then you go to church and you wave at Jesus. You sing in the choir. And yet you've been kicked the dog out the door and the cat. You fussed at your wife and your husband. You might even cuss. I don't know what you've done. But I got, I got news for them little fellers that it's at your feet. They're, they're keeping a record. I close a little illustration. I'm not going to say the word this little girl said. She had a litter of puppies, or the dog did. And uh, one of them died. And she's sitting out on the front porch when her daddy come home. 
And her daddy looked at her and said, why are you so sad, honey? Now, this is a member of the church I pastor. And she said, well, one of them blank dogs is dead. And her daddy said, where did you hear that? She said, that's what you said in the TV said. I'm going to give an invitation. Y'all can leave the same way you come. I don't have to live with you, but I have to live with me. And that, that woman sitting back here on the back row in that purple thing she's got on, I got purple too, amen. I even put a tie on. Y'all see that? I thought I'd act like a preacher today. Well, I got some of you life and some of you ain't. It's like your face is froze. Father, I love you. 